To those that know him, Glenn Triggs is Mr. Suburban, the father of three beautiful kids living in married bliss in Melbourne's leafy surrounds. But Glenn Triggs is also one of the Australian film sector's truly independent voices, a writer-director with six features, I think, to his name, including the horror homage Cinemophobia, the time travel drama 41, the found footage shocker Apocalyptic, and the teen adventure The Comet Kids. His latest is his most intimate and most ambitious work to date, the drama Dreams of Paper and Ink, a journey into an old writer's first feelings of love and rejection. It is a film that forgoes dialogue to tell its beautifully heart-wrenching, very melancholy story. To explain how he made it all happen is the man himself, my friend Glenn Triggs. Welcome to Screen Watching, mate. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. Um, give the listeners a, a bit of a Dreams of Paper and Ink 101. What's the film about? What can they expect? Uh, so it is a, a, essentially a silent film. There's no dialogue in the film at all. There might be one or two words maybe in the background. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a drama about an elderly novelist and he sort of recreates his first love through mo- mostly through imagination and his writings. And it's kind of a, a dreamy sort of artsy film, I guess you could call it. Um, I spent a lot of time working on this film, trying to make it uh, seem as it should feel from my perspective, I guess. It's a very personal film, extremely personal film, my most personal film, I guess you could yeah. say. Um, and yeah, so it's just, there's a lot of music in the film. There's a lot of like, there's lyrics, there's, uh, te- there is text and things to read. Um, but I guess the unique angle is that there is no dialogue at all. And I, I hope that that sort of brings people in out of interest to see the film. It, it's, I mean, it's such a challenging way to make a film, the decision to make it dialogue free. Um, what did you not see coming and what particular challenges were you faced with that took your, your writing and your filmmaking knowledge to overcome? Well, I know when I first decided to make the film, I knew I wanted it to be about a very particular time in my life. And when, every time I wrote dialogue, it just sounded awful and it just it sort of got in the way of the story completely. And so I was out walking one day and then I thought, what if no one says anything like that's, that's really cool. And that's a far more interesting way to tell the story. And as soon as I thought that, I thought, you know, that's the film I want to make. And challenge wise, it actually made things a lot easier. It didn't like, especially with sound and stuff. And, you know, dialogue's hard. Dialogue can be really hard to make work properly sometimes. (laughs) And so it made, yeah, it made things a lot easier. Like it made sound design heaps easier. It made scenes a lot easier. It was all just, I really wanted to show people thinking a lot in this film like I just love the idea of just how close up on someone's face just thinking about something Mm. um and so I put it sounds kind of boring to say it like that and I was very scared for a long time this film would be far too boring for people um but for the people that have seen it so far seem to really get it which is great and people are very surprised by how intrigued they are by the story without dialogue I think they're sort of you know it's it plays a lot better than you would expect it to, which is a good thing. Oh, it absolutely does. It, it, it um, as someone who's several years older than yourself, I, I, I hope you're not sort of drifting into that old age melancholia that I find myself in most of the time, and which this film absolutely tapped into. It's a the, the character of the the um, older writer um, for someone of your age is is a beautifully realized character. She has a great deal of sort of depth and understanding of, of what he's going through as an older man and the love that um, the wonderful Tamara Lee Bailey sort of experiences on screen. You've cast this film beautifully is what I'm getting to. Yeah, we, I, I saw Tamara online and she did like a little video on Instagram or something. And I knew she was an actress and I was like, that's the girl for this film. And if I don't get her, I just won't make the film. Like they came to that, and that was a very easy decision for me to make because I was like, it's, I've got three kids. Mm. I don't want to go off for, you know, so many months and make this film. I'd rather just, you know, stay home and spend time with the kids. Sure. And so when I, I called her and I said, oh, would you like to be in this film? She's like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And I was like, okay, well, I guess we're making the film then. Um, so it was, it all pivoted on, mostly on her and, and Neil as well, the elderly novelist. He was, um, he's a non-actor. He's never done acting before wow. ever, but you can tell he's thinking. He's, he's a very intelligent person. Yeah. Um, so you can always tell he's thinking about something. So, um, and he loved it. Like he jumped at the experience and he had a really good time making this film. And he, um, yeah, he's just, he's just a very, a very interesting character. So he'll be, he'll actually be at the, at our premiere Q and A, he'll get up to, you know, speak for the first time in public, which would be great. So How exciting. Hear his voice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you're a lover of cinema, like few people that I know your films to date have all nodded to varying degrees. Um, 
to the movies and the genres that you and I grew up with. Comic Kids was The Goonies and um, Apocalyptic was Blair Witch and that sort of stuff. Yeah, it had that, yeah. it had the, the influences was there, but Dreams is a little tougher to pin a label on. Were there reference points for you for this film? There was actually none. And I, I didn't realize this yeah. till recently. I was doing an interview and someone um, brought up the same sort of question. And I said, I, yeah, there's no, because I know with uh, 41, that was heavily filled of dreams. I sort of borrowed from, you know, sometimes the the pacing of that film quite a lot and the emotional beats. And like you said, the other two films as well. Um, but this was completely just originally emotionally based. It was just off exactly what I'd been through. Because I thought that, I think audiences relate to more personal stories better like if you, if you try to fake something they can tell and, and as much as you are great at faking things they can always sort of tell and so I thought if I make something so personal that just means something just to me and I don't really care too much about how other people will take it I think they will just go with it and tap into it because we're all you know I'm a human as you're a human and everyone's a human and we have a lot more in common than we realize I guess and so I just knew that if I just trusted my instincts and went purely with emotions um, people would get it I think, and they have, which is good. Yeah, it's such a brave step to make and such sort of confidence in, in your intuitive skills as a filmmaker, and that, and that comes through um, in, in the film. Um, I guess I want to ask, you've got all these features under your belt. Um, each has turned a profit to varying degrees, and you've had sales in the forex markets. You're, you're exhibiting a very natural sort of commercial flair for sto storytelling. Why aren't you banging on Screen Australia's door, pitching yourself as the next George Miller? You should, I, I, I shut you there, sort of doing what they want, what they need, more importantly. Yeah, I've, I have attempted in the past to contact different funding bodies and stuff for things, and people just, you never hear back. We just, they just don't care too much about you. And so I thought, and that it gave me a bit of fire, I guess, at the start of my sort of, you know, independent career that I was like, well, if they don't want me, I'm just going to go off and make my own thing as best as I can sort of thing. Yeah. And so I've just spent the last so many years, just, you know, every couple of years, just trying to make something that, because it just, it, I just love it. Like it's not necessarily profitable, but it's just a pure love of the process. And it's like that initial, you know, and the beginning of all the different processes of when you're making a film. So like, you know, the script writing's really fun because you're creating a story and then you get to meet the people that become those characters. It's always the beginning of each process. I get a real sort of um, kick out of, I guess. So, um, and editing, editing is the magical part. It, it, like as soon as a scene starts to come together, there's something so, like I can't describe that feeling. It's just creative. The final draft, isn't it? That's what they call it. That's the final draft of the script. Yeah, the yeah, stage. but it, it's more just that um, initial when you start to put the shots together and they sort of just work. Some, like most, most, I get lucky, well, I feel I get lucky sometimes. Like most of the scenes I cut together, they, they start to work very easily usually. And then I go back and obviously make changes. But that initial, you know, cutting two shots together, there's something really magical about, that because you've created something that doesn't really exist and you get to sort of control, you know, the world, I guess. That's, that's what it feels like. You get into control something that you shouldn't be able to control, which is like people and emotions and stories. So it's um, heaps of fun and I love it. And I, I go through phases where I love it then I hate it for a bit because it's so difficult and then I get back into it again. They say it's like childbirth, apparently. It's, you know, it's really painful when you go through it, but it's so many years later, there you are. Again. Ask anyone, it's much tougher than childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah, I, yeah, I just really enjoy it. And I've just, uh, I've got many different scripts lying around that I want to, you know, produce um, in the next couple of years. And I'm just not sure exactly what I'll jump onto next, but some are really big, some are really small, but they all, you know, are based on emotional things. I just like emotional stories, I guess. So, yeah. When did what other people could do with the editing machine first impact you? What were the earliest memories? Um, of film uh, and when the magic of cinema impacted a young Glenn Triggs? I remember like movies feel different now than they used to. I find like I used to, when I was a kid, there was something so much more like you were, you were sort of, you really felt like you traveled somewhere. And I, I find it really difficult now to get that same feeling. Um, some of my earliest memories of movies. Um, I remember seeing Jurassic Park in the cinema when I was a kid that totally captivated. Like I had no idea what to expect and, to, you know, people obviously still think, you know, now it's still a really, really good film. So I think we got our generation got lucky to have that come out when it did when we were all kids, I guess. Um, and that was very just, I just totally transported and scared and it was adventurous. And I still to this day cannot pinpoint what makes that movie so great. Yeah. Like there's no real, like the story's quite basic. There's no real emotional, uh, you know, crescendo or anything like that. It's kind of just... I don't know. It's just a really magical story. Yeah. So that, that, that's he, one of my... 
he breaks so many rules with with Jurassic Park for a film that's a fairly conventional blockbuster. There's, there's that great line that Jeff Goldblum has: "We are eventually going to see some dinosaurs in our dinosaur film," and yep, like yep. It's, it's similar, like he did with um, uh, with Jaws to a certain extent, and with Close Encounters, he holds that money shot, the shark or the UFOs or the dinosaurs, till yes, yes, right when the the delivery of you know their appearance has the most impact the t-rex scene or the it's the waiting and the waiting's yeah. good and, that, and i think we've lost the waiting in films now it's just you know the opening scene is you get you're seeing everything yep. and it's so far-fetched and you know people like people are doing crazy stuff and there's animals everywhere it's like okay that's probably as good as it's gonna get i guess like but yeah like to have a movie like that to hide things and have it so realistic that i, I think movies have lost that and that's what i maybe have trouble with these days so um, as much as I'm looking forward to the latest Jurassic World film, I've sort of, the trailers that I've seen, I'm like, it looks so much, you know, it's just, it just doesn't look real. Rory, like, yeah. So that's done that. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, what do you want people to bring away from Dreams of Paper and Ink? Um, what's the, uh, the impact you hope to have on uh, the more enlightened cinema goer? I think uh, my theory was that every person has gone through this to some degree in, in some way, whether it's a family member or a relationship or something. And I find that people, you kind of lock on to someone at a certain age, you sort of, whether it's a relationship or whatever, you sort of, you, you lock onto them. And most of the time it doesn't work out because that's just, I don't know whether that's built into us biologically or something. It is, you know, the lost love thing. Mm. Um, so that's, I think that's what people relate to this by. And I really wanted to, I guess, express how I felt when I went through that. Like I was sort of quite affected by it for so many years and I wanted to sort of somehow get that out of me and, you know, show people, I guess that's what filmmakers do. You want to sort of show how you're feeling. That's how I feel anyway. And it was, yeah, it was difficult to sort of work out how to get people to feel what I was feeling. But I think that a lot of people relate to it, especially guys, a lot of guys that have seen this really get it. Um, and so I think they'll just, uh, yeah, I, I think they'll just take from it what they, can and what they will and people everyone will take something different from it but i i do hope that they feel that feeling of what you know into some r relation i guess of what how I, what i went through when i was younger of yeah. the the loss of someone that's still alive it's it's a really weird thing that you know and it's uh i'm sure there's all science behind why you know people connect and disconnect and all that sort of stuff but um yeah it's, it stays with you it sticks with you sometimes and that's what happened with me so i just wanted to get that out of me i guess in this film as the film does, it stayed with me and, and sort of um, gets its emotional claws into it. It's a really sweet film. It's a very sad film in parts. It's a very beautiful film in parts. I'll never forget the, the guitar sequence between Neil and Tamara. Um, I think that'll be a, a, you know, they'll play that as, as in, your, in your sort of end of career reel. That's a beautiful piece of filmmaking. So oh, congratulations, okay. mate. Um, listen, I've raved enough. Tell us where we can all see it, uh, both in Melbourne and around the country. So it will be at a few select cinemas around Australia and we're posting most of that on our Facebook page. That's sort of where all the news is getting posted. And that's mm -hmm. just in facebook.com slash dreams of paper and ink and, and is the word and not the, you know, the, whatever the other one's called. Ampersand. Um, yes. So everything's on, yeah, the Facebook page, page mostly. And you can follow, I've got, I've also got a page myself, just Glenn Triggs Filmmaker. But um, yeah, if you want to see the film and our premiere is like on the 20th of May at Lido Cinemas. And there's still a few tickets left for that too. So if you want to come along and see the film with an audience and hear our Q&A thing afterwards as well, that's also available to people too. Congratulations, mate. I'm, 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 it's great to be able to talk to you. I've been following, I think I first reviewed 41 all those years yep, ago. And that's right. Yeah, we've yeah. been always chatty on the social media, but we get very little chance to sort of talk in person. So it's lovely to talk to you and, and congratulations on this, this great film. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. All right, mate.